Peace. Yeah, my brother. So just uh, just a quick heads up, right? Um, obviously, everybody knows who Raka is, but this is my brother Tamal carrying the culture, sec, save the hip hop culture. We appreciate you even taking the time to, um, you know, entertaining getting on and actually getting on itself. So, <laughs> no, I appreciate you, man. Good to meet you both. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Man. Man. Yeah. All right, y'all. So this is the after Work. party. What's Was up? That yeah all right cool that so the after party you guys already know every wednesday we'd all go and talk to elements shoot the shit uh talk to guests today obviously we have raka we're gonna get right into it so raka again just to kind of give you a quick heads up we're all about preserving the elements um you know hip-hop whenever we say hip-hop or people say hip-hop by default it's automatically just talking about rap music right. and you know, we do it. I do it. Tamal does it. I'm sure you probably do it. But the main core, the main approach here is to preserve the elements. Old, current, future. So, you know, we're, we're just going to talk here. It's going to be like a little interview, but we want it to be as organic as possible. Just us three having a conversation about hip-hop, if that's cool with you. Perfect. Perfect. Before we start, shout out to, uh, I see my man, Why Not Con, the Big C, straight out of Toronto. You got an international passport stamped up, decorating cats up on here. So, uh, very Bad, bad. I see I see Beyond up in here, Acid Rain. So that's that's what's up. Appreciate everybody coming on. Um let's 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 off the rip, right? And again, when we talk hip hop, and this is a big topic, right? What element started first? What came first? And we gotta understand that the MC is probably the baby of the elements, right? The rapping or whatnot. But uh let's talk about you. Um in terms of elements, how did you come into the hip hop world, the hip hop scene? Were you dabbing into any other? And we know that, but if we can get into a bit detail, that'd be dope. Absolutely. Um, shout out to Mark Love. Shout out to Peace King. Um, yeah, I started in graffiti art, actually. That was that was my way into the space. Um, a classic Los Angeles crew called Create Devastate C2D Crew. And uh, that was family, still family to this day. Um, yeah, that was my first, that was my kind of like my foray into the space. Uh, from there, I kind of moved over to uh, DJing a little bit. Shout out to my brother, Rob One. Rest in peace, DJ Rob One. Fly. Rob One, absolutely. Um, yeah, Rob One, I, I used to, in junior high school, especially in high school, early high school, I used to be at his, his uncle Mike's crib all the time, always hanging out with Rob. He had the turntables over there. And um, I was learning how to kind of DJ from Rob, messing around the tables. And one day he was like, yo, it's Skate, recipe Skate, my brother Skate. He was like, yo, it's Skate's, it's Skate's birthday, man. We got to do him a, a birthday mix. He's like, you want to you wanna, you wanna host it? I'm like, what do I do? He's like, you got to just talk on it, just rap on it. So I was like, all right, I don't know what to do. But he had, and we didn't even have a microphone, so we plugged, it was old school. We plugged in the headphones. The headphones. Use <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, that, with it. Yeah, ex exactly. That's how you had to, we had to do it. So. That was kind of like my first time really getting on the mic, and it was just a fun situation to have, like, um, you know, to be on, being doing vocals while my homeboy was on the turntables, and that kind of moved me over to the rap side of things. But I started in graffiti art. Were you getting into, like, um, like how much were you into it? Was it like a – I mean, were you – because for me, it was quick and over quick because of arrest. I mean, were, were you, like – out there like bombing piecing doing like big big pieces or was it just like how how much of it was it was it for you now i wasn't really you know you know at the time when you're doing it it might feel like you're really getting busy until you see some cats to really get busy so yeah. that was, <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean it's, it's everything <laughs> just to be perfectly honest um <laughs> not you know it was early so it wasn't you know there weren't really that many people doing it at the time you know it was like you know from for LA, I mean, there weren't really a lot of people when I first started that we, we even had to look up to. The community was really small. Um, you had people out the radio Tron, like um, uh, Crime, Rick, you know, Rick One, Crime, uh, Shandu. You had, like, of course, I can't, I can't say anything without saying um, Soon, Soon and Legit. Soon is out of New York, and he came out and really brought a lot of the styles that um, that LA became known for and really gave LA a lot of that that authentic style, you know, I'm glad you brought from, that up. like the old English, the placasos, we were used to like certain gang style writings and things like that. But as far as that New York funk, that a lot of, uh, most of that came from Soon, who, who brought it out from New York. So, you know, I was kind of like a kid growing up, you know, taking the bus to, 
to, uh, to school or looking at West Coast paint and body or looking at all these sooner legit throw ups. Um, and then, you know, WC in my area was like WCA was big, um, CBS. There were a lot of crews that were, you know, that were kind of getting busy at the time. And we were just young kids that, that really loved it. And, you know, we were catching fragments of it, little pieces of it. You know, movie like Turk 182 or something would come out and we would see it. And we know there's more to it than that, but it was still interesting to see. Um, then moving into later on Subway art. And then by probably a couple of years after that, then it was spray can art, you know, that, you know, the different books. So I, w I was pretty, pretty heavily involved in the community and to the theme, more on the piecing side than the bombing side for sure. But um, yeah, that was, that was kind of where I came out of, man. And to this day, like most of my friends that are in the space, I know a lot more, hang out with a lot more graffiti than I do rappers or anybody else. So, yo, do, did a uh, friend, friend play for me because I'm, I'm from the East Coast. Okay. And I mean, I've been out in LA a lot and stuff like that. But, you know, the question I always have for a lot of LA MCs and growing up out East is that, you know, how did you not, how did the G Funk and the Funk stuff not be the primary? Uh, lane for you as far as as far as music goes and stuff like that. I mean, like when I, when you guys came out and I saw you guys again being on the East Coast, I'm like, oh, they're more like a plug-in East Coast group to me. You know what I mean? That's what I that was my take on it. But like, how did you get into what you got into? If that makes any sense? <laughs> I, I think a lot of it was the fact that um, you know we became fans beca before there was like that that West Coast sound. So to me, when I think of the West Coast sound. As much as people would say G Funk, um, that Death Row era stuff that was happening, for me, it's just as much Soul Assassins. It's just as much uh, Heavyweights and Project Blow, Good Life. Um, it's just as much Liquid Crew. So, you know, like a lot of these movements were already happening. It would just so happen that G Funk came out and kind of blew up and became a sound. But, you know, that if I want, you know, that same kind of spice was also used by a group like EPMD. Like they were flipping funk breaks and doing all kinds of things. So, you know, I just, I enjoyed it. It just wasn't the style of, you know, when I, the, the people that made me want to rap were KRS, Big Daddy Kane, Coogee Rap. You know, these are the people that really, you know, made me want, want to get busy. You know, Rakim, you know, these are people that made me want to get busy. So I just stayed true to myself. I didn't, I didn't jump on the trend when it got big. And, you know, to be honest, by the time that, you know, G-Funk was really popping, it was really more associated with, like, gangster to rap or with all the, all these other things and I'm not a, you know I'm not a, I don't bang <laughs> you know what I'm saying like I'm not really it's not it's not really my thing so we just stay true you know when Evan evidence that I met one of the things we had in common was our, our, our love for for a group like organized confusion you know so it was like we, we were just in a different zone you know um we, we just like that that raw rambunctiousness also I think because we came out of out of graffiti art we didn't just start in rap so coming out of graffiti art it was always like they're always uh, diverse diverse influences in graffiti art like especially in LA there were people in LA that were crazy graffiti artists that didn't even listen to rap music they were into punk or ska or reggae or <laughs> death metal or any any type of thing and you know right. they they would tolerate it but, but everyone had on their little walkmans or whatever like you know they were doing their own thing where they paint how they whatever they feel inspires them so we just stayed true to ourselves and that was that Thanks. So, we, real quick, frame of forest year wise, as far as when you were doing that. I was going to ask about that. I was really uh, late 80s, or, you know, going into the 90s. Like, I think that's when I was really, really getting, doing my thing. Um, but I started messing around, like, in the mid 80s. I was a little kid, man. Like, you know what I mean? I was like a little kid just loving life and, and trying, to, trying to do it. It seemed like, like superstar activity at the time you know and especially as hollywood started catching on and you started seeing like beach street and Raymo and learn and, and hearing Raymo talk about phase two when you have like just different things that are happening like to me that was like that was everything and then a little bit later um a little bit later going into the 90s uh those green some people know as omega devious those tc5 yeah. that was like one of my main mentors like he really pulled me under his wing it was like what? book and check out out this style and like you know he was really pulling me in and then um after that i started working at the hip-hop shop on melrose and that was owned by hex and omega H hex tgo not not hex cbs but hex tgo um and uh hex and omega owned that shop so i was working at the hip-hop shop with maniac uh from uti skill from uti oh, uh, yes. and og chino who has the, the restaurant in scala k-town right now he was there 
uh, Chuck from out of Chicago. Who else was there? Freeze Rock and Mark Ski. I met Mark Ski, TWS. So it was just a, you know, I was just around a lot of people at the time. A lot of people show love, and I just, you know, so yeah, I would say it was around that time. But I was, I was brought in and 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 uh, mentored and guided by some of the some of the top people. That's dope to hear. And it's for me again, always just being from where I'm from, and like just hearing LA stories in terms of like, how'd you get into like, or, you know, just earlier stuff. And we talked about, you know, a lot of the West Coast was a lot of the the, the funk, right? Even before too. So. Um, but it's it, it's it's dope to hear that. What's the, tell me more about the hip hop shop because I'm not really familiar with like, what that was. I know it's big out in L.A. Yeah, the hip hop shop. It was um uh, it was it was on Melrose. I think it was Ogden, if I'm not mistaken. Melrose and Ogden. It was right across the street from from uh right across the street from Fairfax High School, right across Melrose from Fairfax High. Um and Hex started. It was like a one little store, one storefront, and um later on he ended up getting the shop next door. So he expanded it from one store into two storefronts. And I remember like, he was real tight with Kid Frost at that time. I think they're still cool to this day, but he was real tight with Frost at that time. So I remember Frost pulled up in, in, in the white LeBaron convertible one day and he was just like, yo, what's up? And Hex was like, yo, I'm gonna get this, this cement laid. Gotta get this, get, this, get this floor done in the shop, what up? And next I know, uh, Frost was taking off his rings. He's like, chill Holmes, we got this bro. He's like, what he said was, this is a direct quote, he's like, yo, He's like, um, me and my uncles laid the the cement for LAX homes. Don't even trip. You know, he's like, we we got this. <laughs> Threw me his car keys. I went to uh, at the time it was right uh, Builders Emporium, like a shop called Builders Emporium. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, bought a bunch of like um, concrete, like concrete powdered concrete, and some buckets and like a mixer and all kind of stuff. Took it back to fair. Took it back to the hip hop shop. And uh, Frost mixed it up, did whatever he had to do, and taught me how to lay concrete. I mean, I don't remember now, but at the time, he taught me how to lay concrete on the floor, like, because he was like, I got this. That's Watched crazy. it, put me back on, jumped in his whip and dipped. Like, that was, that was, you know, that was how it was. So, <laughs> yeah. Kid Frost taught you how to lay concrete. Straight up and down, straight up and down. Shout out Kid Frost, that's what's up. Oh, gee, that's so fucking so, so, so then, okay, so we, uh, we want to put things into context, right? Years. So we started off with the graph stuff. You said the 80s. Hip-hop shop was 90s, right? Yeah, this would have been like early 90s, 90, 92, something like that, around that time. 92. Yeah. So you obviously can tell we're trying to go on timeline. We might bounce around. Yeah, I'm good at, at one point. So I'm good at timelines, but I'm great at bouncing around. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so, okay, so you did the graph stuff. Um, you know, you were doing a little bit of the DJ stuff. Yeah. Now, you know, following your career i heard somewhere and i might have i might have heard it through an interview and you did a little bit of popping too right not well not really here so what, what happens is people are always like yo so you i know you were into graffiti i know you into rap did you ever were you ever a beat because i was I'm, you know represent rock steady crew for rock steady, that's my next question too from that era all the you know so everyone just assumed that i was like some kind of secret b-boy killer because ah, i was i right. uh, rep rock steady um, but I would tell people like, nah, you know, I was never nice. I was horrible, to be honest, like as a, you know, as far as like floor skills or whatever. I was like, I, and I would tell people I used to pop and lock a little bit, you know, cause everyone in LA could, you know, kind of, kind of do a little something on the West coast could do a little something, but I was never nice. That was, that was definitely not the reason why I was put in rock steady crew. I'll put it that way. <laughs> well, and that's funny. And I'm glad you bring that up. Right. Because, at, at, you know, towards the beginning of rock steady, you know, you have to be a B-boy. That's what it was. And then you get into the point where that now rock steady you know, you got, it doesn't matter. You, you got, uh, you know, you know, arsonist era where it's like your MCs, yep. you know, and now, now Rocksteady is not just B-Boys. It's just an all hip hop crew. Um, yeah. You know, the, Leg said it. So was, I'm glad you put that into that perspective. Was, by design, I remember um, Crazy Lace coming out to LA and we had the first Rocksteady, West Coast Rocksteady crew meeting. So we brought down uh, Hubert, I think Mike and Apollo from, um, uh, from, uh, yeah, from Daily City. The knuckle a, a b-boy crew a dance crew called knuckle neck tribe there um, party, oh. yeah, party with leah maxwell and all them and alex aquino from up there um it was a lot of people then we from san diego we brought up uh uh zodak and severe and saki and a couple other people that were on the beat side of things and legs really wanted to kind of take rock steady crew at that time i don't want to speak for him but my understanding was he really wanted to take rock steady crew and without uh without negatively um, impacting the base of Rocksteady crew, 
and the foundation of Rocksteady Crew being a b-boy crew, he really wanted to expand it and, and, and really touch hip hop culture across the board and have people across the board represent Rocksteady. So yeah, I was invited to be a part of it um, as a graffiti artist and as an MC. Um, and we had a big meeting and, you know, it was a lot of people that were put in at the time, people from Air Force, LA Breakers, um, a lot of people like San Diego, Cisco, other LA people. Um, it was, it was a pretty crazy, it was a pretty crazy time. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to fast forward just because we're on the topic. All right. So that era was very culture centered, almost panel like you had people just, you know, active really active on the preservation and keeping the culture tight right somewhere down the line we lost control whoever lost control and it got just it went all over the place to where you know the djs did their own thing the b-boys went to do their own thing the mc did their own thing promoters are now not hiring djs and f the b-boys we don't need them we just need a backtrack and right. the, you know, we're not paying where do you see hip-hop culture right now are you happy with it in terms of the way it's being represented, not just by the outsiders, but the, the culture heads themselves. You know, it's, it's a tough situation because in every in every step of the way, oh, before we move on to that, shout out to my man Zulu Gremlin. I, always, I got to shout out Zulu Gremlin as being a part of the, the main hip hop hip hop shop crew. Um, so I would say that there's more, more good than ever. There's more good MCs than ever. There's more good DJs than ever, more good B-boys and B-girls, beatboxers, um, DJs, every across the board, there's more good than ever. But due to the fact that there's more access than ever, that means there's more whack than ever also, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always look at it like, especially right now, you know, you don't have to worry about what's on the five TV channels anymore. You don't have to worry about <laughs> this on the radio anymore. You can listen to whatever you want to listen to. So... Yeah, there's a lot of whack out there. You know, there's a lot of people that are just doing it because it's a hustle. They try to make money, or they, they think it's an easy easy route to fame. Um, but I would say it, it's worth it. It's worth it to discover, you know, some some gem, some jewel that comes out of that out of that that garbage dump. You know what I mean? Like out of all the ridiculousness, somebody's doing it right. And maybe without this same access, we would never hear those people. We, we would never hear. Um, you know, you know some of these people who are, are getting light. So, I mean, yeah, I, I just recognize that I have the ability at almost any time to just, if I don't like what I'm hearing, to turn it off or to disconnect from it. I don't have to subject myself to it if I don't like it because there's plenty of good out here too. So, yeah, if it's up to me, it would be a more uh, stringent um, process to get through. But, you know, it's no longer, you're no longer at the whim of, or at the at the mercy of of record labels or uh, you know pro radio programmers or whatever like you know people are gonna get on so you know if anyone gets on and does it if they're doing it the right way I'm happy for them like you know I might not, I might not tune in I might not be a fan but maybe hopefully those people find a way at some point to take whatever light they have whatever energy they have and turn it into something constructive and educational so that people can really recognize this isn't just a hustle this isn't just a lick this is a culture people have died for this culture um and you know to disrespect the culture and and still try to eat off of it is is something that's you know is really uncomfortable for me to deal with you know i, I but I, I choose not to just deal with just not deal with those people and instead I, I use that energy to support the people that i do think are doing it right yeah. good point i like that no, um so let's do this i'm gonna again we're gonna rewind so we've talked, you know, say early, so 92, the hip hop shop, um, there is, I mean, we're going to get into the whole career, seeing dilated, you know, all that stuff, but put this into perspective for me. So it, you know, there's, there's, there's 95, there's a quote unquote unreleased album, bootlegged album. Um, you know, you can find it on YouTube now, uh, battle hymns. Was it battle hymns, uh, imagery battle hymns, battle, and political, battle, poetry, political poetry, poetry, yeah. Yeah. 95. Now, for those that haven't heard it, I mean, that sound, you know, if you, so I, I know people that haven't heard it, right? And if you obviously go back and say, okay, you, the dilator has a sound, mm. 
right? Mm. There's a hip hop sound, there's a babu sound, there's an evidence sound, there's a rocker sound. But then when you listen to this, it, it, it's almost, I, I, Tamal and I always talk about it. Early hip hop, you know, 84 doesn't sound like 86. 86 doesn't sound like 88. 88 doesn't sound like 90, 90 doesn't sound like 93. Very small intervals between different sounds to where Maybe. today, something from 10 years ago sounds like the shit from today, right? So you can hear that where that album or that project, you can hear there's a little bit of the early 90s. Yeah. Now, can you tell us what happened after why it wasn't put out? Um, and this is my personal suggestion. Would that ever be accessible to us? Other than you that it needs to be released properly or some shit. <laughs> so if yeah, yeah. In the comments, if, if, nah. if, Rubik's is in there like, it needs to be released properly. <laughs> uh, shout out to the Uso Big Rising. Um, yo, um, it's, uh, it's interesting because it, it, no, it'll never get released because evidence will never let it be released. Okay. Uh, and in fact, the versions that are floating around, nobody actually has the real version of the album. Oh, We've heard oh, sure. heard like a bunch of like versions and people have like pieces of it, little fragments of it, or they have like, you know, early demos or they have some other stuff because stuff at the time was moving around on tapes and, you know, people would be in the, in the, in the, uh, in the dub room making quick, quick tapes, sliding their jacket and then keep doing their job. And then that'll get slipped to somebody else or whatever. Yeah, copy so, copy of a copy of a copy of exactly you know what I mean? so there are people that have like pieces of it and people have heard parts of it but nah, we never we never it was never it never we dipped before we even had to turn in the final joint like we never even had to turn in like the official like here's the final cut so um the final cut is something that'll never get heard i can't stop what's what's floating around on youtube or whatever else i think it's interesting i'll go listen to that like oh that wasn't even supposed to be on the album that, that was just a random demo that just got Put into the mix of things i've seen artwork i've seen all kind of stuff but yeah. for the record like nobody nobody I, you know, to be honest i don't even know if i still have it i know ev has it in like a safe like it's like he's like he's not letting that go anywhere so um yeah no i mean it is it's, i would say it's extremely unlikely that it'll ever come out or that'll actually ever be heard in its <laughs> final version you know you, okay so uh you, i know you don't know most people on here hopefully know but I'm a big collector of shit, right? So I collect records and, and tapes and all sorts of shit. And I'm really, even though you're telling me, yeah, it's not going to get released, and I would love to hear the final. I didn't know there was a, a, a final version, but the, 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 the version I've heard gets cut off, right? So there's a track, and then it's like cuts off, and it goes to track two or track That's three. And it's like, oh, I want more. Yeah. But there's a little bit inside of me that geeks out over the that you're telling me it's it would never be released kind of like kind of like mf doom right MF Doom, you, know, you don't know what he you looks can't like fucking have it sec. <laughs> you can't have it like no and, I, like, and, and again a little bit of me like, loves well, it. i love that that's that's dope yeah um let me let me talk a little bit about that that album All so right. you had t love uh you had exhibit on there okay well the version that, that okay. we heard and then there was a track uh with i think it's for all of y'all with red man yeah. how did that happen how did that the red man track yeah, yeah. Uh, um shit, how did the red man oh so um we were signed to a record label called immortal records right. and immortal records is the same label as like um volume 10 funk dubious um they had some rock groups on there maybe incubus or somebody might have been on immortal but it was you know it was like it was it was owned by a guy named happy walters who also owned a company called buzz tone management so buzz tone management um Manage Cypress Hill, House of Pain, the whole Soul Assassins, basically. Cypress Hill, House of Pain, Funk Dubious, um, even the Hooligans, which is Alchemist and all them, uh, Alchemist and Scott Kahn. And then uh, later on, they ended up managing uh, Wu Tang, like members of Wu Tang. They ended up managing like Def Squad. And when they, you know, by managing Def Squad, which is, you know, Eric Sermon and, and yeah. Red Murray and all them. That's how I think we got the business connect. Obviously, you know, we were we were we were actually signed to uh to Lethal Dose. So DJ Lethal from House of Pain, House of Pain right. was the person that gave us our first our first like industry plug. Like he put us on, he signed us to I mean we were dealing with some other managers and some other people in studio and whatnot, but Lethal, who I've known since we were kids, and we did he also did graffiti, like we we're in the same circles. Um he uh he was the 
one that he signed us to Lethal Dose, which was his production company at the time. And through Lethal Dose, he got us like with the Mortal Epic. So um, he already knew Red, you know, from being in, you know, just hip hop circles. And, you know, he Red, was, Red Man was somebody that we were big fans of still to this day. I'm a big Red Man fan. Uh, so the opportunity at that time came to do a record with somebody. And, you know, he, he was one of the people that we suggested record label was like yeah you know at the time you got to go to the label and they were writing big checks You're like you know you want this person on your record label you got to write a check and get clearance and do all this jump through all these hoops that was somebody that they were like all right all right yeah this this would be worth it so we did end up recording it and and you know just to speak on that album um uh, you know to uh, what you said about the album none of that is ai like that is us that is us really doing it and it did capture a certain time it's just not necessarily the final versions of the songs or the final sequence or the complete album. Maybe there's a song or two missed. Depends on the version I'm listening to. Um, but it did capture that time that you were talking about where it was kind of like that transitional time coming, you know, going from one era, like eras kind of shifting or you can see here's real distinct spices and, and, and textures from different eras coming through on that. The, the other thing I like about it too, and again, it, I, I have to reference the fact that it's of the versions that I've heard. Uh, I'm a big fan of the four track shit, right? So like the er like early Mystic Journey, yeah. in, uh, Living Legends, all that. You know, it's all four track and it's real dusty. And you know, some hip hop, surface hip hop heads are like, "The fuck is that? It sounds whack." Yeah. Uh, but to me, I mean, that's what I grew up with the tapes. And again, copies, of copies, of copies. So, and I'm not saying yours sounds dusty, but some of the recordings sound like that, and it, it's kind of nostalgic too. Um, it takes me back to that era. So that's dope. So yeah, that was '95. Um, again. Oh, that was some of that is also by design too. So like when you, you know, it was, it, it, when we were trying to get our sound down, like we were, it was also the era of kind of moving. Some of that stuff was like, you know, uh, we were adding dust to it. You know, we were, we were sampling like the, the record pops and all these other things yeah. to really a certain kind of the feel, like to bring people into that experience. So some of it was just what it was and some of it was by design. I want right. oh, to go back to um, early, I always like to understand like the the energy behind a group forming, like like especially when motherfuckers are teenagers or whatever or whatever it is. Like, so what was like the vibe and the juice and the mindset behind dilated being dilated and just the even the energy behind the album that didn't that didn't come out. Like, just what was you what was your whole mindset as whenever that whenever it was? What was going on there like for you? You know, Evidence and I met originally at, um, <clears throat> we originally met at at Motor Yard, which is a graffiti yard in, in West LA, like Palms, Palms kind of not far from Culver City. Uh, so we met at Motor Yard. Um, I think he was there with Vision from WCA, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and Motor Yard was kind of like, you know, I, I considered that AWR yard, because like, so much AWR stuff was happening over there. And that was the crew that Ev was from. Um, so we we first met there. I was with my crew, uh, C2D crew. Like I was there with Spell and Lust and a couple other people. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, we met there. So we knew each other as graffiti artists before we knew each other as as, as people that made music. Oh. And then a little while later, um, I was at the hip hop shop working at the hip hop shop, like I said. And uh, there's a there's a cat named um, named Self A W R uh, Th Three Fremont. So uh, Self uh, uh, and Ev were from the same crew. They were from AWR together. So I saw Self. He's like, yo, this is my homeboy, Vane. That was, that was Ev's name from AWR. And I was like, yo, I met you before. I met you at the He's like, oh, yeah, you see you crew. I love that character you guys were doing. Like, So we just kind of chopped it up a little bit. And then Evidence was like, yo, I rap. And I was like, yo, me too. He's like, yo, I got this. I'm doing this record with, um, who was it? Uh, QD3. He was doing a record with QD3. And uh because at the time, QD3 was like his next door neighbor, like lived two doors down or something. And he had the, this, I think it was called QD3 Sound Lab. That was like his crew and his his studio, his project. So he's working with like uh, Justin Warfield and uh, I think Poet Society and like just, I think, I feel like Funky Town Pros, but I, that, that might be wrong. But he was he was working with um, a lot of different people. And Ev called, he was like, yo, I'm gonna do this posse cut. I want you to jump on this posse cut. And I'm like, all right, cool. And for whatever reason, 
when it, when the time came to do it or maybe the date because it was at a time you know there weren't really you know you got in the studio when you could get in the studio or you were paying a, a gang of money so the studio day came and, he, and i was probably the only person that could make it at the time that he could get the studio time or whatever but it just turned out to be a song he and i just did the song together like nobody else was on the record even though it was supposed to be a posse cut and we just liked the vibe we're like yo we should do another one we should do another one so we ended up um going through that and you know we were still graffiti cats you know most of our homies on both sides were still graffiti on. uh we were he and i did even I mean, even did a piece together in venice at one point like it was like we were, we were we were having a good time and um uh that turned into us forming a group and you know for me coming from the era that i come from it was always like eric b and rakim like cash money and marvelous mark like the dj's name went first like the dj was the foundation of the culture the way that Based, you know, so for me, I was like, it feels awkward to be a group that's that's so respectful of hip hop culture. Be a group that comes out of graffiti art that moved into, music, but we don't have like our DJ. We don't have a DJ that we can celebrate. We don't have a DJ to point at and be like, it's better than your DJ. We don't have a ability to do like like a a, a DJ song on the record album where you know like you know like a DJ solo song where we could just let them get busy. So. For, for me, it was always something I was looking for. Um, I was I was real cool with uh, like Red Matic from from uh, Beat Junkies, my brother Red J Rock. A couple of the some of the Beat Junkies guys were also rock stars. So from, from there, um, I got a hold of this tape, and it was called Comprehension, and it was just like it blew my mind. And it was from this new DJ that just got put in in the crew called DJ Babu, and I think Red might have slid it to me or something, or maybe my man G Wiz out in Texas. I'm not sure, but um, well, he wasn't in Texas at the time. He's in Texas now. But uh, I think that's how I got the comprehension tape and ended up talking with Babu. I went to his crib. You know, we smoked. It was He was living with his parents, so we smoked and, and blew it out the window type era. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, you know, smoke and blow it out the window. Um, but, um, yeah, that was, that was how, you know, Babu came. We invited him to do... Uh, a, a show with us because at the time we were working with whoever we were doing shows already but east swift from the licks with, with dj for us or rep Matic with dj for us or new mark from j jurassic five with dj for us or just different people that we were that we were down with at the time would, would get on the tables for us but we didn't have our own dj and that was something that was important to us so all those things were kind of happen happening you know at sort of at the same time and eventually um i talked to ev and i was like y'all want to bring babu into the crew have thought about it and he's a ev is a, like a, a little bit younger than me and he came at a time when you know the rappers were kind of moving more toward the front stage you know what i mean so for him it wasn't at the time as big a deal he was like yo we can have anybody come do the scratches i'm like no 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 like live shows like we need to have this we need to have our band back there we need to be able to throw it to him he needs to be and he, when i explained it to him that way he got it he was like yo word all right cool so we, we put babu in the crew and that was it that's dope. When when was this? Um, let's go back to this. I mean, date wise, like, like your initial meeting with Ev back, just so I can just frame it. Uh, like roughly what year or year or so was this? I would say it was probably when I first met Ev, and it's funny to see pictures from back then. How long? How young he looks? I think he was probably like fourteen or something like that. You know what I mean? So he was. We were, everyone was super young, but fifteen. Maybe he was fifteen when I met him. But um, that have probably been like ninety ninety one, okay. maybe something like that. Yes. Yeah, so okay, and then. And then up into and then how long were you rocking before babu came into the picture uh i would say i mean that's when we first met and so then we we kind of you know we were around each other but not close for a couple of years hmm. like kind of seeing each other but once we started working i would say we were probably like maybe two years two because we had done already um we'd already done like a couple like a couple projects like not albums or our own projects but like we already had songs featured like the bomb worldwide compilation and you know from bomb magazine and different things like that uh we were already doing we had an abb 12 inch out already before we we put babu in the crew um and you know i think babu joined around the time that we were recording uh, like officially he became like official member when around the time we we did um uh work the angles um, okay. Even though he didn't do the cuts on that record, because Babu, <laughs> I think he learned his lesson that day. We were like, yo, come to the studio. And he was like, yo, I'll be the, whatever. He ended up not coming to the studio like he was supposed to. So we called Rev, Revolution. Revolution came down and dusted the cut. He killed the cuts. Oh, and after shit. that, I missed another studio session again. We're like, nah. Because <laughs> he, 
But but yeah, there was, it was it was so early. I don't think anyone knew what was ahead. It was just like, yeah, I'll come in. Yeah, whatever. It's all good. But I don't think he realized what what he was doing. So he missed that session, and, and that's why Revolutions cuts are on work the angles, even though Babu was already in the group at the time. Yeah, that's a jam. Okay, so and I don't want to. You know, we we normally do an hour. I don't want to take too much of your time. I want to. There's a ton of shit I want to ask. So obviously, you know, '95, the album I want to come out won't come out. And you know, Babu gets in. Now I, I love the fact because I've seen you guys live several times, um, and and the live show because you mentioned it before, right? The DJ scene, um, really with everything, right? It happened with B Boys. The B Boys shit died out, and then Rocksteady came back and revived it and all that. Same thing with the DJ scene, right? The DJ went. The DJ scene kind of died out, quote unquote. And then there was when I say. You know the elements kind of did their own thing, right? Like you brought up bomb, uh, bomb hip hop, yeah. right? Up north, shout out Dave, uh, uh, Dave Paul to, that created a lane for these DJs. So then, you know, that's where you get the scratch hamsters and the pickles, and you know, beach junkies were already, already a thing, but they kind of got their own lane. So when I see you guys live, that's that's a, that's a dope experience because just like J Five, right? You got Cut Chemist and and, and Newmark. You know they get they get a, a a a section all to themselves and not just you know tuna and everybody just rapping right they, the DJs do their thing same thing Babu Rhythmatic you know everybody comes in and it showcases the DJ the backbone because normally the DJ's in the back and the forefront is the rapper so yeah. um, I really appreciate what you guys did and what Babu did and the, the space that you gave him so let's get into the first official album the platform. Um, and I want to. I don't want to waste a lot of time because I want to get into your joint and all that good stuff. Oh. But what it, you know, was there was there a formula? Was there something that you went off of, or is it just like we've been we've been working so you know so long, and you just kind of grab joints and put it all together? It sounds really great. So to me, it sounds like there was a formula, but that's the question. So for the platform um, specifically, it was a combination. So there were some of the 12 inches that we were doing from ABB, some of the stuff that we were working on at the time, um, mixed with us being in the studio and having the freedom to kind of get in there. But we went into the, we went into it with attitude that we weren't going to start trying to create major label music, whatever that even means. Like we were gonna, like, if they, if, if this is what they want, we'll give them this. But if you don't, if this isn't what you want, don't even bother signing us. Cause this is what we're going to do. It's going to be rhymes and cuts. If you don't like beats, rhymes and cuts, then go sign somebody else. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think they probably wanted to go sign other people. Um, but because, you know, we were like my man, um, 3A, um, 3H, I'm sorry, not 3A, shout out to Rate 3, rate 3A, uh, rest in peace. But my man, um, 3H, Joe, he um, he was one of the people that was really instrumental in, in, in getting Capitol Records to, to, to come after us. But he was throwing these parties like we were doing um whiskey and we had like multiple sold out nights at the whiskey with no record deal. and you know nowadays that's not unusual you know nowadays you have an opportunity with social media and all these other things to kind of build up your fan base but at that time for us to be kind of an underground group and have you know sold out events and you know i remember having to get um uh tom wally and uh um uh, uh who else uh not, not was 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 Jimmy IV in there? I remember having to get the the Interscope guys into the show because security wasn't even letting them in, and they were there trying to sign us. And it turned into a whole bidding war with Capital and Interscope and all that. Wow. Yeah, that was it. Was it was important for us to to do it the way that we felt it needed to be done. And um, there was a little bit of a formula, but it, the formula was just as simple for us as beats, rhymes, and cuts. Like if it's not that, if it's not based on that. From there, as long as the integrity of that was solid, then we can be as creative as we wanted to be. But we never want to float off of our base, which is beats, rhymes, and cuts. Were you, were you ever forced with any, like, um, presented with any, like, situations that where it made you feel like enticed to kind of go down another road, some bullshit road? Nah, you know, because we were making we were making the right money. We were just doing it our way. So it wasn't like we had it like, you know, it wasn't like, you know, just to get us in the door, they had to pay us right. And they had to, you know, at least give us the right upfront conversation. Like later on, it turned out that, 
you know, we had to learn the difference between um, creative freedom and, and financial freedom when it came to, or creative license and financial license when it came to actually doing projects. Because you could have all the all the uh, creative freedom in the world, but if, you know, they decide how much they're going to invest in your project. And at that time, you know, there, you couldn't do a video on your phone. You couldn't record a song on your phone. You couldn't upload your phone. There wasn't even the internet you know, to speak of. Like, you know, if it was, it was like more colleges or something at that time. It wasn't anything like to use for networking or to put out projects or anything so um they there was never a time you know i think in the beginning there was everything was what it was because it, it was it was working it was successful capital was also in a bad place they had already killed their at the time they killed their um their rap department and they were kind of known as kind of like an anti not you know kind of a little bit of an anti-rap label you know so you know they were coming to us like you guys are 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 you guys are good look for us right now you guys are the culturalist you guys are the you guys aren't the polished you know pop rappers you guys are grimy you guys are sweating on stage st you know stage diving slam dancing <laughs> you know the, the shows the graffiti guys are at your shows just as much as the you know the b-boys and you know that stuff um and then coming from la and as you mentioned earlier like having that kind of sound that that kind of locked tied us in with new york um we were really embraced by that and also from from me being rock steady crew and at the time zulu nation i had a lot of um people not just from the east coast but from around the world that were really tied in. but we didn't really have to get off our square too much and do things we didn't really want to do later on as you know as the label got their footing and they found success they merged with priority there were a bunch of other things that were happening they started to feel like they knew us how, what we should do better than, than than we knew ourselves and that's when there were a lot of you know issues that popped up but in the beginning you know like i'll say the first two albums there were no problems like we did what we wanted to do and it worked oh, that's dope. Who, where did the logo come from the logo shout out to my man brent rollins um so you know uh brent rollins did a bunch of stuff for you know from black alicious to gang star and just just a bunch of stuff he he, he works at um I know you go, you know, Ego Trip, Ego Trip Magazine and the Ego Trip List and all that stuff. So Brent was like the, pretty much like the creative director and the creative force behind that. He did a lot of our album covers and he, and he's the one that designed the actual expanding man, the dilated icon. And then the name dilated peoples though, was actually, it actually came from Alchemist or, you know, one of our, he, Alchemist is like the, uh, you know, Alchemist is one of the unofficial members of dilated, you know, that's like, basically evs but i met ev he, alchemist was like his best friend already like they were young you know high school kids just you know causing trouble all over the city you know what i mean like just kicking up dust and causing problems so, <laughs> they're young, uh, younger than you right yes yeah. right you're a little yeah yeah exactly so to me you know as you get older the age doesn't matter but you know the younger you are the more important those years are so i look at these dudes like three year four years younger than me like they're little kids wrong with kids families and all that stuff but at the time it was like these dudes are some crazy kids man like because you know they were like knuckleheads to me but they were fun and and they were loving life and they love hip-hop culture they love the music um rap music so you know i was i was down with them but i had a i had a um we were looking for a new group name our original group name um was was fatliners and that was based on on graffiti art and we ended up changing it for a couple of different reasons but we were looking for uh a new group name and and i had a I, we were about to do our publish bmi and our ascap you know you do your, your song rights and all that and i was thinking about naming my my music publishing company uh my music publishing company expanding pupils and to me expanding pupils was a play on words because obviously you know you open up your you open up your pupils but also it meant growing students like expanding pupils so I was like, yo, what if we call the group Expanding Pupils? And I think Ev was the one that took it to Alchemist. And was like, yo, what think about, you know, you know, Rocket just suggested Expanding Pupils. That's kind of ill, you know. It was shrooming, you know, we were having a great time at that time. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, Al is like, yo, Expanding Pupils is dope. But what if you flipped it? What if it was Dilated Peoples? And we're like, that's it. That's it. That's sick. And, you know, and, and, and every other name that we had that we were putting on the board. We would ask people like, yo, what do you think about this name? You know, will you like this? You know, think about naming. And everybody would be like, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. And for this, we're like, let's not even ask people. Let's just tell them. Let's just tell them it's called Dilated. And we did. We're like, yo, it's name it was Dilated Peoples. All right, dope. That's what it is. And they, we never looked back. So, so, so I've mentioned, uh, and, I, and it, Tamal and I were talking about, uh, and this is my take, right, and what I've seen. 
So I'm from Southern Cali, right? I'm I'm 45 minutes south of LA. Okay. Um, Orange County. Okay. Give or take traffic, but yeah. too many shows. <laughs> seeing right. you guys. I mean, I see the logo. Um, seeing the logo everywhere, and to me, to the to the quote unquote underground heads, I see that logo, and I see, for lack of a better term, I see the cult following the the the, the hardcore heads. That logo is kind of like seeing a Wu Tang logo. Like you, you don't have to, you don't have to have dilated peoples under it. You don't have to have a picture of you and Ed and Babu. The logo is there, and boom, you know it. Kind of like when you see a Wu Tang logo, right? Um, what do you think made you guys that get that following? Not just at home, but overseas. And then I got a follow up question regarding overseas. Yeah. So. Um, at home, I think it was the fact that, I mean, nobody has seen a group that looked like us before, like, you know, really pushed through. Um, nobody had really heard at that level people from, I mean, there are people that were spitters. Like you had people before we came out, like that, you know, so, you know, uh, um, so, uh, soul assassins, you had the liquid crew with the alcohol and all them. You had people that were spitters, like, don't get me wrong, but you know, we were really like, one of the things that made us stand out was the fact that, you know, we we didn't have what you know by the time we came out there was this g funk sound already that was happening and whatever else um so you know they they recognized quick that okay these dudes are like hip hop culturalists you know from LA so that made us that made us stand out um we also invested a lot of time in our sound so even though it was you know like i said beats rhymes and cuts at a certain point, especially Ev, I got to give him a lot of credit. You know, he he has like like canine hearing. He'll be like, "Oh, that's one dB off." Like, you know, he could just hear like something happening. Yeah. And he, pull it up, and sure enough, he's right. Like, damn, how do you do that? So, um, you know, you had people like that um, that were, you know, that were making great music. But we also invested a lot of a lot of time in our mixing and our mastering because we figured we're not going to make pop records, but we got to make records that from a from a sound quality standpoint can play next to pop records so we started investing a lot in okay if we're gonna this is gonna be how the record itself is gonna be written how it's gonna sound then we got to make sure that you know we're taking it to um you know the top mixers the top mastering companies we're making sure that if our record comes on if, you know if our record comes on after a snoop record or a missy elliott record or eminem record or whoever was pop time like whoever was the big you know top of the charts that there wasn't going to be people weren't going to have to start adjusting their radio to start making sure it sounded right. Like it was going to still be able to be. It was going to turn into an issue of if you like the record or not. Not is it messing up your ears or whatever. So we did all that. But I think a lot of it was that we were just in that small fraternity of of groups that really love hip hop culture and didn't have a, a problem with with our roots showing. So you had you know or you know had like Souls of Mischief. You know even even before Souls, you had Dell. And you know, introducing hieroglyphics. The first time I heard hieroglyphics was on Burnt. You have Far Side, and you know, to be perfectly honest, like Ev is really evidence really put me up on a lot of these dudes because I was really a little bit closed minded at the time. I was really into my G rap. I was really into my rock him. I was really into like more of the hardcore spitters. And he was like, "Yo, you got to listen to you know Soul Flower this uh, uh, you know uh, sound on this uh, compilation or you know from Far Side, or you got to listen to." to these high road records and I, you know eventually he got me i was like all right i get it like i get what you what you've been trying to tell me so you know um ev is a, uh, you know he's 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 somebody that really helped open my mind to a lot of things and i think that kind of came through in the music and allowed us to create music that really connected with people across the country and then around the world i think one of the things that really helped us was that we invested in those relationships early a lot of people maybe not so much today i don't know but um, but uh, you had uh, you know, people in in uh, um, in Europe that appreciated the fact, the fact that we weren't just out there when it was time to promote a new album or when our career was on the downslope. Like we went there at the height of everything and made and brought them in to being a part of it. You know, um, and so you know we could take you know, uh, and 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 at the same time you had groups that always showed us love in cali you know as representatives so you had like the you know the um the, the heavyweights the good life the project blow freestyle you know they're still better than almost everybody um 
so you had you know a lot of groups that really showed us love and would 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 support us and not look at us with jealousy but look at it like okay they're they're also people that are really shining these lights so i think it, it wasn't one thing there you know a lot of the a lot of it had to do with like alignment there were a lot of different things that came together and we just you know we were just sharp enough we kept our, our blade sharp enough so that when when it was time for us to do what we had to do we were just we were ready to go um but you know there are a lot of people that played a part in in our success i mean we're nice i'm nice on the mic ev is nice on the mic babs is nice on the tables we were surrounded by a lot of top producers and we were working with a lot of really good people um engineers we work with some of the best in the world troy seagal on show like people like that, that 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 always showed uh that you know anton people that always showed um that always showed love and that really brought us in and then i don't know how, how you want to go but eventually it just started creating relationships overseas we spent a lot of time at dnd in new york recording you know uh you know develop relationships with people like Premier and the beat nuts and all kind of people it was just it was Great situation. Oh, it's a dope situation. Shit. Guys, uh, so, okay, I, again, I got, we can go three hours, but I, we won't take that much of your time. So I want to okay. kind of go go forward. So, you know, we all know Tyler People's great discography. Um, I wish we can get into the details of what songs and this and that, but I want to get into, man, we already know you, Evan Babu, uh, Alchemist, and whoever it is you guys are using for production is, is top notch and that's all classic shit. You said Joey but Chavez. you mentioned Joey Chavez? Say that again. Did you mention Joey Chavez on the, on that list? You gotta mention Joey Chavez and Tav Sid Rome's that's Tavish and Joey Chavez. Joey, like they were Chavez, yeah. And, and and you know the funny thing is I was gonna post because um uh the A B B records uh, uh promotional post that I was doing, everyone was like, Yeah, Joey Chavez and I did you know I did a post of you guys um uh, with the joint with um with the far eye. Um, and then, you know, everybody else. So, yeah, I was going to post that, uh, Joey Chavez. But what I really want to get into is, is you, I mean, your, your, the list of tracks that you're featured on um, is, is super long, right? From, I mean, you've been, you know, Soul and Members, Razzcaz, Herbalizer, Boom Bat Project. You're on the Beneath the Surface compilation. If you guys don't know what that is. Beneath the Surface compilation album is is insane. Yeah, sure. A lot of West Coast underground, yeah. Los Angeles underground. Yeah. Um, so, per personally, uh, this is a, a question for myself. I know it was a close, uh, close people, right? So, Cholo and Cinco from OMD. Yeah. You had, I believe, Dark Leaf or a few members from Dark Leaf were on that on yep. that track. How did that track come about? I I mean, it's. Again, just being in the circle of people. Shout out a lot of those. A lot of those people were out of life or the blow um, on that album on the on the beneath the surface album. Uh, shout out to Od Omid. Uh, um, I've known Alex and Danny uh, Tumex and Shola Lancinco for a long time. Uh, we're we're all from from the same part of L.A. The same, basically the same neighborhood. You know, uh, Mid City. Uh, shout out to Merce too. He rep Mid City. Um, but. Um, through, through, we ended up linking up, getting real tight with with OM, with Alex and Danny with OMD. I even put out um, on my label. I had a partner at the time. We had a label called uh, Nerve Deafness, and um, we put out the Exitos y Mas Exitos for. Uh, oh for, yeah, yeah. Like that was my arm. Uh, that me and my partner at the time uh, put that out for Alex and Danny. Like we were, we were all locked in. We were all family. You know, still. I just talked to Alex yesterday. I just talked to Tumex yesterday. That's my brother right there. So. Um, but but at the same time, I was it, it was just a pretty small circle. So I was I knew a lot of the people that were on the project. I don't remember who actually called me. It was probably two mechs that called me to to come down, or maybe Od might have called me. Omid might have called me himself. But I don't really know. I was happy to be on it because I love that 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 commute that particular focus that 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 particular community. Like it's super tight. They really support each other. So to be invited, I, you know, I don't think just because. Uh, at the time, I had a record on the box or whatever it was. You know what I mean? That yeah. that I shouldn't, you know, know that that I got it. That I got it all my way. Like there's still people that I want to rock with, you know. And to be honest, when you look at people that were on that record, on that album, um, and you look at people that come out of the good life, you could look at people that 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 come out of Project Blow, the Heavyweight Family, like all that whole style, that side of things. Um, you got some of the most um, underrated and underappreciated killers. I'm talking about 
mass murderers. Like these kids are taking, you know, they're taking heads off of entire ciphers. Like so to be to be able to be invited onto something like that, or later on to to be a, on the Good Brothers, you know, to be one of the members of, of the Good Brothers project, you know, things like that. It was it was an honor to me because it let me know that, you know, my skills were that, you know, they were, they were up to par because these people were skill based. Like if you didn't, if you didn't have skills, they were going to tell you to please pass the mic and I was going to be it. There's going to be a problem. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, it was, it was a great situation. No, uh, no. Yeah, we only got, we got very good. Yeah, so, okay. So I'll make it quick. I, Cause I want to, I mean, I, I love the dilated, the, the stuff that you're featured on, but I really, uh, the crown of thorns joint, um, we're, we're running out of time. So a few things. Uh, Crown of Thorns is really more on a personal level, right? right? Dilated is kind of, you know, the hip hop shit and you have to DJ and all that. But Crown of Thorns was on a personal level. And every joint, you know, from Delilah to, I mean, every, everything is dope. I want to talk about, again, because we're talking about the, the, the elements, the joint Mean Street with Charlie Tuna. Ah, right. Um, and, and really, I mean, there's, there's several songs I want to talk about. Uh, but just for the sake of us having a, just a few more minutes here. Um, I've only, you know, when it comes to MCs, that, you know, so like, let's put it this way. Um, Wise Intelligent used to be a graffiti writer, but I, I can't, uh, unless I'm, I've been under a rock, I don't recall a song of him talking about graffiti or him doing graffiti or being a part of it at any time. I found out through a conversation, I was like, yeah, I don't know, you, you were bombing, you were graphing. Um, and several artists were like that, but obviously you with both dilated or, uh, you know, on a, on a feature or on the song me street, you're really, you know, you're, you're breaking down what I love about it. And it reminds me of a big, Ju big, just song, uh, plantation rhymes. If you haven't heard it, where he just spits out just names of graffiti writers. Right. You on the other hand, you're spitting out crews. It's, yeah. it's uh, kind of hard to. It's, I mean, because normally when you hear a rap, you're like, okay, there's, I need a story. What's happening? Uh, but I mean, you're literally giving out three letter uh, crews and you're on point. Uh, how, did that take long for you to write? Was How easy was that? And obviously shout out Charlie Tuna for doing the, the, the course. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it was it was a great situation. That was a weird one because I, I, I wanted to do it. I had part of the record already done, like written. And uh, I, I call Ev and I'm like, yo, I want to do this. I want to do this graffiti song and um, talk about, you know, the era of L.A. that that really inspired me, kind of like my 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 experience in the L.A. graffiti scene. And uh, um, he heard I kicked him like some just acapella, just some of the stuff which got changed a lot later. Um, and he was the one that was like, yo, I got this record from L.P. And I was like, LP, you know, this is before Run the Jewels, was like LP from Company Flow, like, you know, F Jets, like word. He played it to me and I'm like, ooh, like he flipped that one, you know, he flipped what he did and he made it right. And I was like, uh, so I talked to him and he was perfect because of the record that Big Jess did, because of the Blanchard, because of the end to burners, because of the, the different things that were happening on the, um, on that side, um, he got what I was doing. And it was kind of like, almost like a West Coast version of that record, you know, like even though I didn't listen to that record to write this, but when I, but, but to get with LP and to have him do, you know, something like that, it just, it was like the universe, it just made, it clicked in and made it make sense. So, you know, I, I give a shout out to certain people on there, but a lot of it was just the crews that were going on. And there's actually even a verse, there's actually even a verse that never got heard because we ended up cutting, we ended up cutting a verse and then I lost the session file the session that had to cut oh, the and then i couldn't ever remember how it started so i couldn't i can remember like a couple fragments of it but it was you know i was writing so much i'm in the studio i'm in, i'm freestyling some of it i'm writing some of it down in the in the booth oh. and like I'm, I'm i'm on the back of menus just you know taking pieces and just piece it all together so you know i didn't have like you know a notepad where everything was written out nicely and i could be like oh let me put the fourth verse yeah let me go back yeah. and, and... So it just got lost. But, you know, there are a lot of people that didn't get shout outs, you know, in that song that should have got shout outs in that song. Some of them were actually on the other verse. So to everyone that didn't get a shout out, <laughs> peace to you. You know what I mean? Like, did, there was, did anyone come back to you and be like, yo, what the fuck was up with us? Kind of. Yeah, a couple a couple people did. A couple people did. Like, but it, it, not not like in a, in a challenging way or disrespectful yeah, yeah. way. 
yo, remember the time we, you know, we, well, yo, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Well, yeah, it's yeah. always gonna be somebody. Yeah, mm -hmm. but a song like that, you know, you can't do it minutes of song, name everybody, and not miss somebody. So, yeah, shout out to you, I see you, Craig G, Juice Crew, Almighty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying big up. Yeah, so what up, guys? Yeah. yeah, so that so you mentioned Craig G, that was another feature, right? You were featured with Craig G and Marley Mall, too. You know, it's not just West Coast, I mean, you you branch out. So, shout out Craig G and Marley Mall. Yeah. Um, all right, so, uh, yeah. so tomorrow, I don't know if you have a question. No, I just unfortunately. I got another Zoom I got to get on, so I have to I have to get ready to get off, unfortunately. Now. Yeah, yeah. I'm in the... So, uh, Rock Up, man, I appreciate you. Um, quickly, I don't know if you have anything going on. I know people are like, when's the next solo album? I don't know if you're working on anything, but this is kind of your time to, to provide us the, the, the information, if, if any. Yeah, I mean, I think something's happening. I don't want to say too much. I'm, I'll, I'll give you guys a, a, a notice when the time is right to, to, to uh, let it be known, but, you know, I just... Evan and I have been, in, you know, we've been kicking it. So some of some, you know what I mean? Cool. No, that's, hey, <laughs> that's on, again, that's that. I, I hate to not know, but I love to have that suspense. It's COVID. Yeah. Rock, it's worth appreciate it. you, brother. I appreciate you coming on. Uh, Tamal, I appreciate you too, brother. I know you have to go. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been great, man. Thank you for taking the time to, to talk to us about your history, about hip hop and all that good shit. Yeah, no, it's great. I appreciate you both. Thank you for the invitation. Shout out to my man, Super Network. Shout out to... Uh, J5, everybody making it happen, and uh, Tasty Waves. Like, it's a, it's a lot of good stuff. Golden Leader, I see you. Big up to everybody that came in and, and keep supporting the show, man. Supporting this. Yeah, they had a lot of gems, man. I just want to say I really appreciate sharing a lot of gems because, you know, from, again, my perspective is is different. So it's like I got I got to go inside. You know, I always get to go in sex world, but I got to go inside that world because I was on the other side of the country. So it's it's dope to, to you know, to hear a lot of that. A lot of that history because it's something that's very important to to the whole shit. So I, I really appreciate hearing that. So appreciate you. And I appreciate it too. Shout out to the whole community. Check out to you. Yeah, it's all love. Thank you again for the invitation. And um, yeah, let's do it again. Words, Absolutely, brother. We'll reach out. No doubt. Peace. Right. Yeah, right, be good. Peace. Peace, y'all.